Hello friends and family and welcome to the Global Pandemic Crippling Anxiety Fireside Chat. We won't be doing 10 minutes of meditation together today. I will recommend that you do 10 minutes of meditation guided on your own. And uh, in, still in case anyone is stumbling across these videos and happens to not know me personally, this is not meditation instruction and I am not a meditation teacher. This is more or less literally a fireside chat, one-sided. <laughs> uh, today I wanted to discuss the topic of racism. It's, um, it's relevant always, but we're seeing a lot of it right now. And I wanted to broach the topic in terms of how it relates to truth you tend to see a lot of back and forth between various camps or philosophies of thought pertaining to the truth of certain situations. What is necessary? What is unfair? What exists or doesn't exist? And I have a small story about this, the title of which is essentially not all racism is created equal and the story is actually the story of us coming to Jammu we came in a cab first of all so our status in society means we didn't have to take a government bus we didn't have to walk uh, we certainly weren't walking barefoot we were in a cab and um, fairly secluded from the rest of society until we got to the government hospital where we were tested. And when we got to the government hospital, we were standing in line and the queue had social distancing uh, at the back in the parking lot near the police. But as it got closer and closer to the nurses, the social distancing got narrower and narrower until people were uh, not touching but they may have well have been. And while we were in the parking lot, the fellow in front of me kept turning around and waving his hand and saying, back, back, social distance, social distance. Um, and it was clearly because I was white, uh, his other friends who were standing around him, he would put a hand on their shoulder, he would talk right into their ear. Social distancing was not high on his priority list. And as we got closer to the nurses and the line became more and more bunched together, um, the anxiety level of the folks in the line visibly increased. People were anxious, they were complaining, and this old man who was standing in front of me went and sat down. <laughs> um, and uh, good for him. He was taking a load off his feet. We were standing for many hours. Um, and when he did so, I left the space in front of me that he'd request, requested that I keep. And the younger fellows behind me, I guess well, younger, they were about my age. Um, would repeatedly stab me in the back and kind of push and I'd turn around and they'd give me kya what are you doing um, and it was an uncomfortable situation it was certainly an uncomfortable situation and it was a situation that no one else in the queue was in uh, it was it was for me alone but this was really at the beginning of the protests in the United States and the global fallout from that. And I remember thinking when we left this government hospital that this is racism, no doubt, but not all racism is created equal. And the difference is that at no point in this situation was I unsafe. 
as the only white person for miles and miles, I was not unsafe. And I didn't feel unsafe. I didn't even feel powerless. Um, and those feelings really matter because if we're not honest with ourselves, we can tell ourselves that the discomfort outweighs the feeling of safety, which it really doesn't. And other people don't have these luxuries. How this pertains to meditation is it may seem like a bit of a leap initially, but it's not. It is our ability to be honest with ourselves. And being honest with ourselves is, it is the first honesty. It is the primary honesty. You have to lie to yourself on some level before you can lie to anyone else. And there is a, there's a symbiotic relationship between external honesty and internal honesty um, that I won't go into now. We'll, we'll talk about it in a future video. But this relationship is recursive. So as we break our external honesty, if we tell a lie, if we hide the truth, um, if we make something opaque, we make it more difficult to be honest with ourselves internally. And as it's more difficult for us to be honest with ourselves internally, we tend to tell more lies or to hide more truths from the outside. And this is something that was certainly not apparent to me, even on an intellectual level, um, until I started meditating seriously, even as a beginner. And it is something that I think everyone comes across in their meditation practice in time. And it doesn't give you insight into everything. It's not as though, so this old man in front of me, he was Muslim and he is in the major Hindu city in a majority Muslim union territory, which has recently seen a lot of shifts due to a Hindu nationalist government and it shares a border with Pakistan. This is an extremely complicated scenario. I can't begin to comprehend how that man feels, what he's feeling, why he's feeling it, what his life history is, much less the complex structures which surround him and create the foundation for his life story. But the truth doesn't need to be omniscience. I don't need to know everything. I don't need to know everything about this man, about his personal truths, his personal life story. I only need to know the level to which I don't know. And that's quite a lot. And this is where meditation can help us, where we can take this this symbiotic relationship, this recursive relationship of internal truths and external truths, and we can cut into that a bit. And we can say, oh, okay, let me, let me look at something that is true and work on that, exclusively on that. It's not easy to find something which is inherently true, um, but the breath is. You know the breath to be true. It is there. And it's there all the time, so it's a useful tool in terms of its presence. You don't need a special room. You don't need a special seat. You don't need a special app. You don't need a special audio clip. You need nothing at all to focus your attention on the breath. And it's true in a really fundamental way, which is that it's incredibly boring. <laughs> Um, there, are, there are much more exciting truths to be seen in meditation, but um, if you started with those, it would be really shocking. And so you start 
outside in with these gross truths, these apparent truths. The breath is coming into my nose. Okay, it's coming in, it's coming in, it's coming in. Okay, the breath is sort of stopped. Okay, it's going out, it's going out, it's going out. There's nothing about that that anyone on the planet finds fascinating. And so because it is such a boring, apparent, gross, surface level truth, it is safe for us to work with. We're not indulging in any philosophy. We're not indulging in any ideal or idea. Um, and that allows us to work with at least one internal truth. Internal in the sense that it is our internal bodily feeling which allows us to know that we are breathing. So we work with this one truth and we work with this one truth. And what we find is that our, our attention, our mind, has no interest in the truth. It doesn't want to sit and objectively observe truth for more than a split second. And then it starts running away to fantasies and games and ideas and uh, memories and emotion and everything else. And in the process, we'll often find that it is insisting the whole time that this is the truth. This is the thing that you should be paying attention to, not the breath. Um, you need to be worried about the state of racism in America, even though you're not there and there's nothing that you can do from here. You need, as while you're meditating in particular, you need to be worried about this situation, this politician, this famous person, someone said something mean, you need to be worrying about your family right now. When the truth is that while you're meditating, you have no agency in the external world, there's nothing you can do, and thinking about those problems hasn't solved them yet. So you're giving yourself a platform to say, oh, okay, let me observe truth objectively, as objectively as I can for 10 minutes or one hour and see what happens. And what we find is not that the truth reveals itself to us. We find, well, it is the truth in some sense. The truth is that we can't pay attention to the truth. And so this is the practice of paying attention to the truth, paying attention to the truth. And so far, I haven't ever come back to the breath. And unlike my philosophies and my politics and my ideas and my preferences, I don't find I ever come back to the breath years later. And, oh, dang, I didn't see this about the breath. Ah, it's, a, it's actually different than I thought. And the truth is different. Um, you will find this with everything else. You will find this with philosophies. You will find this with ideas. You will find this with your politics. As you grow up and as you experience more and see more, your perception of all of these things will change and the truth pertaining to those will change. So the external truth is not static for you or for anyone else, certainly not for me. And there's nothing that we can really hold on to there. We can't say, oh, okay, the, the plight of the Dalits or the structures which put white people like me in positions of unfair power and unfair privilege that we can focus on that as some sort of universal truth because it's not. In 10,000 years, white people probably won't exist. But if we still do for some value of exist, um, we certainly won't be in the position that we're in in 2020. And so by practicing internal truth, by working on this internal truth, we can get larger and larger glimpses of external truths. And these external truths are useful in the sense that when I come across a situation where uh, someone is trying to offend me or trying to embroil me in something that I don't necessarily need to react, I can act. If someone is hurting someone else, I can act. If someone is hurting me, I can act. But my reactions can be decreased, my automatic reaction, because my automatic reaction is almost always useless. It's never going to produce a valuable outcome. And 
as we work through this internal to external truth exploration, and the external truths are not explored, they simply become increasingly apparent. We start to see a little more clearly, a little more clearly every time we sit to meditate. We start to recognize the truths about ourselves and about the world around us. We will begin to see the totally invisible truths, that they don't exist in the material world, not in any significant or obvious way. So things like structural discrimination, systematic discrimination. If it's systematic, it may be codified in laws and then it's easier to see. But if it's simply structural, if it's simply the way that we interact with other people, the way that we look at other people, the way that other people look at us, it is extremely difficult to see those things in the light of truth. And there is little to no way to examine them and get a clearer image because we're constantly looking at them in the same way. The problem is not what we're observing. We see some structural problem in society or within ourselves. And we know it's there, but the fundamental issue is not our object of observation. The structure itself is not to change somehow due to our observation. It is the way in which we observe. How are we observing the external world? That is what we need to alter. And we can't do that on the outside. So we work with an internal object, an object that we know to be true, an object that we know to be flawless, for some value of flawless. Um, and we work with that and work with that and try to see it a little more clearly every time. Oh, okay, the breath. I keep working with the breath. And the longer I can see the breath and the narrower I can put my attention on the breath, the more truth I see in it. And the more willing my mind is to pay attention to the truth rather than wandering off to these other ideas and other philosophies and other politics that we currently believe to be true. We all have a current set of philosophies, whatever we happen to be believing this year, this moment, and that will change for each and every one of us. And so it's important to work with that on both levels. So we have both sides. We, ha we have the external side of these structural issues that we want to we want to be an agent of change in helping to clean these problems up. There is structural discrimination. There is massive inequality. There is suffering in the world. There are people who need our help, how to help them. And even the question of how we can help is a question of truth because we often wildly over or underestimate our abilities and our influence. And so we need to see that clearly as well. I hope that this has been useful to some of you folks um, and that it's relevant to some of you folks. Um, as I said, I will not be doing the 10 minute meditation today. I'll be putting up the same two instructional videos as usual. Um, which can help you install the Dhamma.org app on uh, an iPhone or an Android phone and you can follow along with the 10-minute instructions or if you haven't listened to them yet, uh, the 15-minute introduction and then 10-minute instructions after that. And uh, we can meditate alone with those instructions um, but know that other people are around the world meditating with you and um, wishing you all the best. So I hope that you are taking care of yourself and your family and your friends, whoever you may be, and we will see you back here tomorrow. Goodbye.